This is the Living 1982 podcast. Were you into the punk scene in the very early 80s or someone who discovered the genre along the way? Well, we're doing some deep diving into the Seattle punk scene and sharing the story behind a band that was very short-lived but made a lasting impact with members going on to being in some of the biggest bands in the world. Their debut album was never released back in the day but is finally out now. This is the story of The Living. On today's episode of The Living Podcast, we are joined by Joe Keithley, a.k.a. Joey Shithead, from the Canadian punk band DOA. DOA was the band during this era, and the Living Band members have all mentioned that their show with DOA was the pinnacle of the band's short existence. Welcome, Joey. Yeah, hi. How you doing? Um, uh, better than should be, actually. <laughs> all things okay, good. I think um hanging in there, hanging in there pretty well. Um, so the band The Living, I know you guys did at least one show with them here in Seattle yeah. um, because my band was on that bill too. Yeah, um, I, go ahead. Yeah. And it was, I have the date here. It was um, uh, June 12th, 1982 at the Monroe's Dance Palace. Yeah. And, I, uh, you know, I remember, I remember notably for being a, being a hall show that uh, Dave Gregg lit his guitar on fire. Okay. Hey, um, I do remember that show too. In fact, I dug through my posters. So I'm going to show you this, uh, see it, but that's, uh, that's the show right there. Yeah. Monroe, Monroe's Dance Palace. And the bottom of the poster is ripped off, but you can see the admission is four dollars and ninety nine cents. So, <laughs> was there some guy standing out at the door with a roll of pennies? Like, okay, yeah. Oh, don't forget your penny, everybody. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, Dave probably lit his guitar on fire. Uh, he had this like strat. He kept lighting on fire, and eventually it got so dry. Uh, from being lit on with this uh, lighter fluid because he thought you know he wanted to be Jimi Hendrix or whatever type thing, and uh, <clears throat> in San Francisco it was so dried out it lit on fire that the thing broke apart, and people from the audience saw that stage at the on Broadway started grabbing chunks of it, and then stayed, instead of Dave being cool like oh yeah you know who gives a crap he also I'm like please give me back my guitar I need my guitar back right. <laughs> <laughs> and I we all laughed at him like <laughs> yeah he was the coolest guy going and all of a sudden said hey hey you sir can i have back that piece right <laughs> i'm gonna need that this time tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> also remember because uh before you guys went on he's like hey uh quick can i borrow your guitar cord uh my mine seems to be missing i was like oh yeah yeah sure here and then he hands me back at the end of the show this guitar cord that's all <laughs> it's like oh yeah uh Sorry. <laughs> they, the other thing about that show, uh, so, okay, DOA, the Fastbacks to Living, Monroe's Dance Palace, uh, it was about 100 degrees, like something like that. It was just, I remember being in the most insane place. Uh, the temperature was like crazy, but they had to keep all the doors closed because the sound in the area. So there's absolutely no ventilation in the place. I don't remember that, but it's just like, we had been in San Diego the day before and attended this like pool party, like one of these parties where you, we hopped the fence into a neighbor's backyard. They weren't there and dragged me and uh, some guys from Reno dragged in a, a keg of beer we had stolen and dragged into the pool party. So by the time I got to Monroe's Dance Palace, it's 100 degrees. And I was holding my head going like, oh, God, I'm glad this is the end of the tour. <laughs> Yeah, I remember it was you know it was blazing hot. There there are some yeah. photos from that show that somebody has because I, I I think I you know I don't have any of them, but I I think I remember seeing them and it was a you know makeshift stage and when right. uh, when Dave lit his guitar on fire, he had already arranged for somebody to turn out whatever lights there were. Oh, know, okay. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, so I remember it was you know totally wild. Yeah, it was out of control as 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 things were <laughs> as things tended to be back then but um you know i know that uh duff from from the living yep you know was pretty much you know he's always said that uh, the doa were kind of his 
you know, like, like every every position of DOA was something that he was 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 going for. You know, the Randy <laughs> Rampage, Randy Rampage. You know, he wanted to be Randy Rampage on bass. Absolutely wanted to be Chuck Biscuits on drums, right. and then ended up being uh, you know guitar player, singer too. In tribute, yeah, to no, him. that made. Yeah, um, no, that's great. Uh, uh, you know, it's great that DOA can be influence on somebody uh, uh, on people that have done great in music, right? So uh, that's that's a cool thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Randy was an influence that people just looked at him because he was like crazy, out of control, uh, dyed blonde hair, bass player spinning around and smashing his guitar and stuff. Yeah, which which is which is kind of interesting. I was also just thinking, sort of that maybe the uh, the you know the original DOA lineup could have been, you know, one of the like, uh, you know, of course in the in the the you know the the arena rock, you know, scene there there was you know people that all people in the band were you know like uh, these these mega stars and stuff like that. But like I the sort of like the the DOA was almost like the Who in a way that everybody was. You know, like you know, everybody was was absolutely notable. You know, like it was right, right. just like you know, your snotty singer and a guitar player that just stood back there, and a bass player that barely played, and a drummer that just you know, like a lot of a lot of yeah, right. bands just learning to play, and you know, uh, everybody was a little bit you know, they tried to sound good and stuff like that, but but it seems like when when DOA started coming down here and people people were watching you guys it was it was you know it's it's sort of what everybody wanted you know there was there was never anything boring about it there was never nobody was right, ever right. like taking it easy you know nobody was ever sitting back and 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 in anything and then with Dave Gregg then you had the uh you know the stripy shirt you know, lead guitar player who, you know, was out there, you know, doing that. And yeah, I never, I hadn't really thought of that before. Just yeah, no, Dave was great. It was, was sort of like the punk rock, the who, and still is. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a great, uh, yeah, great combo of characters, that's for sure. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, Chuck, Randy, and I held together for about four years and and it wasn't long Randy left um, early eight, eight, early eighty two, and then Chuck like uh, not too long after that, right? But um, you know, Dave stuck with me for about uh, eight years or so, right? So, you know, um, you know, DOA's. Um, I think DOA's been through. I think we count up like thirty members. Now, you know, they're current. Some people say I'm I'm hard to get along with, but they're fucking nuts if they say that shit, right? Yes. I'm gonna kill them. I'm gonna kick their ass. Not fucking nuts. Regular. Yeah. 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 Well, it was a real accident that DOA even happened in the first place because uh, um, the way it worked, I guess, a real quick thing that uh, I came back from Toronto. I had a band called the Skulls. We broke up. So beginning of '78, that put an ad in the paper. That's uh, so who was looking for a drummer and a bass player, punk rock band. And Randy came along and tried out as a drummer. And he was okay. And uh, I thought, oh, okay, it's not bad. And then Chuck, uh, who was doing with Slowberry, came along and he was just like, wow, okay, this guy's uh, got to be great, right? And of course, he turned out to be one of the best all the time. And then I thought, huh, I bet that Randy guy, well, he knows rhythm. I can teach him bass. Right. And I grew up as a drummer. So DOA started with three drummers. That was kind of our, the, the rhythm boys or whatever. <laughs> so. Right. Right. And, and a, a, you know, very good, a very good background for, you know, playing music. If everybody, yeah, yeah. everybody has at least a knowledge of what it's like to play drums, then. Yeah. Even, even if you can't do it, uh, it totally top notch. Um, I mean, that's why I, why I became a guitar player because I play with the, Grew up with Tim Wood, Chuck's older brother, and we were both drummers. Then after a while, it was, it was clear he was a much, 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 much better drummer than I would ever be. Right. So, at 18, I picked up a guitar. I thought, hmm, I'll never be in a band if I, you know, I'll get kicked out, and then I'm just an unemployed, a useless drummer. Right. So. Right. Right. I'll just start my own band and play guitar, and show, <laughs> I'll show you guys. Well, then I start thinking the the first time I saw you guys. Um, 
was it the bird in 1978 it must have been yeah because we went to uh Mabuhe, our first road trip i think in june 78 and then on the way back uh we got a, a show with the enemy yeah yeah, yeah. that's the bird yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And which i guess is kind of them and the lewd would be seattle's first two punk bands i think yeah pretty much Correct i mean me it was wrong. you know like it depends on how how hard you dig you know you yeah. can say and, and what you consider a punk band i mean there's you know like the telepaths you know like but right. uh but definitely the enemy were the first band to really go for it and and they started a club right. and they they did it i mean they got other bands they you yeah. know they they went the extra mile and and you know got something going which they had that was their manager that robert guy robert uh or is that the ludes manager uh that might robert bennett i think was his name yeah okay um, no i don't the, the uh, yeah roger, maybe they weren't connected right yeah yeah the, the enemy's manager was roger husband's I think, who was also the manager or the, the guy that ran the bird, the, the rock club. And yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I think he gave us 25 bucks, so it's better than nothing. <laughs> well, but, you know, we're like, we were like, oh, who's this band called DOA? And they came across like, you know, oh, well, these guys think they're pretty tough. And uh, so like originally, like the first couple songs were like, wow, this, this, uh, we're not quite sure about this. And then instantly we're like, fuck, this band rules. And, you know, like from, from then on, it was like, wow, you guys are great. And I bought that, uh, that first uh, four song EP. When you yeah. guys had a little box of those in the, in the back room yeah. where they had the popcorn and stuff like that at the, uh, at the bird. And, and from then on, I, we're just, you know, just great. Uh, just super fans basically right but um i think one of the things that uh that you know the 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 i mean you guys really you guys really did it you i mean you you what you booked the tours you you did things that so many bands only wish they could do you know right. back then i think that's what sort of you know that's what sort of happened is is people looked up to you guys because you go on tour and not only you know you do shows you do hall shows in vancouver which we went to uh, but you play bar shows too you like sort of did everything <laughs> you know yeah, there, I, there was no kind of things. there was no kind of holding back we were predetermined we uh Got out the Disco Sucks single probably about June 78. And uh, I remember I, I took those things and I mailed them to magazines and clubs with a little letter that said, hi, we're a punk bar band from Canada. Can we come and play in your town? Right? And then we'd wait for a letter to get back. Sure, you can come, come and show up, right? So, and, and that's sort of the way I then I, I, I became unafraid to phone people up and go like, oh, hey, we'd like to come and play, right? You know, we never... I didn't know anything about money, so we generally played for nothing, right? <laughs> to, you know, or maybe like food or something like that, and some beers, and uh, and we just uh, you had to be to really take the initiative. And I found that uh, I found a like-minded guy uh, that we exchanged a lot of notes with, which was Chuck Dukowski from Black Flag, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we got to know the them really early on, right? Like when uh, down in L.A. by early '79, and so Chuck and I would uh, change exchange numbers. So, oh, uh, don't go to that place. That guy will rip you off, right? Uh, you know, no, no. This is what. Go here. You'll get a hundred bucks or whatever, right? And we just sort. Of, so we did an awful lot of crossing like on North America, as obviously Black Flag. They were like uh, uh, completely determined as well to you know pulling a trailer behind them and uh, just just going getting it done. I mean, and meeting a lot of people. I mean, uh, and making a lot of friends over the years. I still have, right? Not all of them, but a lot of And I think, you know, that was just great. And then that, that sh the, uh, the show in June 82 down here at the Monroe's yeah. Dance Palace, it was uh, Phil, uh, Phil Spectacle put that one on too, yeah. which, you know, it was just, the, I didn't think about it back then at all. It's like, Phil's like, oh yeah, I'm doing a DOA show. Do you want to be on the show? Sure, sure. 
then you start yeah. thinking about it's like wow he was putting on shows in seattle in a in a different country <laughs> you know yeah people, you know, like, and, and we played with you guys uh, up in up in Vancouver, maybe the Arcadian Hall. Um, you I know, like, think, or yeah, on on Main Street and Six, I think, yeah, they, I mean, yeah, yeah. Because of course, I remember yeah. the poster for that too. It was uh, DOA Fastbacks and the Silly Killers, which that's was, right, yeah. You know, and, and their singer uh, was was not present for the show. And uh, you know, just re you know, just remembering these things, and and uh, and and you know, to, to think of like, what if I wanted to put on a show in Vancouver? I'm going to call a a, a, a hall. <laughs> you know, it, what, this wasn't a place that had rock shows. You know, it yeah, was right. Just a, a place you know that you'd rent for um, I don't know for you know a, a, a dance. Monroe's <laughs> dance show. You know, yeah, we but, went uh, there and we looked at the name. What's the next show? Monroe's dance fellas are like, okay, that that could be great, right? Yeah, so. that that sounds <laughs> just <laughs> yeah, that was great. I found another one uh, you might remember here. Um, let's see, back from the metropolis. So I don't know if you went to this one. I'll hold it on the DOA Poison Idea, the parts at the metropolis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's eighty two. Yeah, yeah, there, right? could so. be eighty three. I think the Metropolis yeah. might not have actually started till eighty three. Right. Uh, I see the tickets went up. One of those dance fellows is four dollars ninety nine cents. This one's five dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> so fifty ones they've gone up by fifty one cents. So maybe you can judge it from that, right? Yeah, so. yeah, because price. You know, your 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 fee had gone up. Uh, you know, ten percent <laughs> at that point. Then instead of I, instead no, we have become. Instead of having a bunch of pennies to throw at the band, then there was actually uh, two quarters that at least everybody had that they could throw at. Uh, well, all those bands were pretty tough at that point. There was no nobody was probably going to get stuff thrown at them. At, at that point. But they're good. If was the farts, were they still going in '83? I guess. Well, it just yeah. I mean, I, I'm glad to hear it. It's like DOA, Poison Idea, and the Farts, right? Yeah, and yeah. That, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess uh, guess so. I don't totally remember, but they must have been. It's August, Sunday, August 1st, 82, I'm thinking. I, I've gotten the back of this poster since 82, but I, I, mean, I could be totally wrong. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that, would, that, would make, uh, that would make more sense because the living, after they sort of split up, they and some of the FARTS members started 10-Minute Warning, yeah right okay yeah um and there was you know there was there was appropriate to this uh this this discussion there was you know some combination of band members and people you know going from one band to the other and yeah. as 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 you know to think of that that was kind of a sign of the times maybe particularly in 1982 you know it just seems like everything was sort of getting shaken up and you know, maybe at least in Seattle, a bunch of people are probably getting tired of playing the same, you know, shows in the same places. And, you know, by 1982, nobody in Seattle was getting anywhere, really. And right. um, so it may have, you know, sort of just kicked some people into gear to get bored of their band that they were in or to, uh, you know... Yeah you know like and it's like okay well i'm gonna do something different i'm you know this isn't working for me i i, I want more than what i'm getting you know and because just it almost seems like throughout 1982 tons of bands in seattle were changing members and they play for six months and you know make a drastic change and have a new name and and people were just doing doing kind of anything anything they could you know, probably seeing, you know, bands like DOA and the Subhumans actually out there playing and touring and doing the things that everybody wanted to do, but not being able to do that themselves because maybe there was one person in the band that was a fuck up and made it so you couldn't do anything or, you know, people had different ideas about what kind of music they want, you know, like all the, all the normal yeah. things, but, you know, well, like I think, the, uh, I think one thing there occurred that, um, Okay, so I started playing punk rock in 77, as I'm sure there's punk rock in Seattle probably in 76, early 77, right? You know, Ramones came to town, uh, I think early 77 came to Vancouver, 
like on their first album, maybe that was 76, we saw them. And, um, but the first four years we had all, all our, our early bands, like some humans, uh, Dish Rags, Point Six, DOA, the modern bands, young Canadians, kind of the core of the scene bands mm-hmm. that, you know, people still kind of remember, right? And, uh, but by, you're kind of right in the sense by about 80, late 82, 83, a lot of people started splitting up and the bands started breaking up, right? The subhumans were pretty well done. Uh, point of sticks were in almost in complete disarray. And the other banker bands were def- definitely broken up. They tried to move on, some starting new bands, right? So, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Which were successful or unsuccessful. But uh, yeah, and it was kind of one of those things that if you didn't get out of town and play a lot, then the momentum stopped. Exactly. And, yeah, know, and that. And yeah, so it, just to your point, there's like that. Like, what the hell am I doing this for? Like, it's my same uh, fifty uh, drunken friends. Every time, every two weeks, we play down at the whatever hall, or it's a, you know, the, right, right, and, and that's that's fun and everything. But especially yeah. if you're, you know, in 1982, I was 21. Duff was 18. Right. You know, you're just like that age i mean it's just like it's fine playing the shows that you play for whatever reason but then you see people getting something more you know they're they're getting yeah. out there they're playing shows up and down the coast they're they're you know just doing more uh just getting things done and and making records and yeah. making records that sounded better and you know and all all those things and it's like well these you know these guys aren't really doing that you know what can we do and, you know, oh, well, this guy in this band is really gung ho and ready to, you know, take it to the next level. You know, so people yeah. start rebuilding their things. And then, of course, a lot of bands, it sort of loses, you know, getting all the ambitious people together, you know, maybe sort of possibly could lose some of the initial kick ass factor of just a bunch of weirdos getting together and and uh, playing, playing killer music yeah. as fast as they can. But, um, you know, like I was was just thinking, like you know, like the hardcore scene. You know, probably when was hardcore eighty one? What month was that? Do you remember? February. Uh, I'm just working on that because it's the fortieth anniversary, so it's it's kind of being reissued in uh, cool. August of this year. But it, it was out by February. Um, February eighty one. Yeah, February eighty one. And yeah. we all we all went up to those shows. Yeah, we had two nights with Black Flag and Seven Seconds was supposed to be there, but they didn't make it. They came with another form, right? Yeah. And, you know, just thinking sort of 81, 82 into 83, you know, the hardcore scene was, was you know, kind of getting going. And, yeah, and really. Yeah. Then, uh, you know, maybe by 83, 84, that started kind of burning out a little bit and so many yep. of those bands started playing you know slower music and hard rock and having big hair and frizzy you know like la sort of style yeah yeah <laughs> just sort of thinking of the you know the natural sort of progression it's like well all these metal bands are playing and all these girls are going to see the metal bands whereas <laughs> you know the hardcore bands were you know not all not only dudes but uh you know it was it yep. was heavily dude oriented sort of scene um and you know the which which in some ways you know made for some some interesting music but at the same time you know a lot of those bands kind of lost lost their killer edge i think um yeah i I would agree um it transformed you because the hardcore scene got got more metal and also, they like, kind of got like a bit more of a skinhead element in it by like 84, 85, and which, you know, started to make it not fun to go to shows. Like right, 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 right. I mean, that was the thing about hardcore about shows. Yeah. Hardcore shows, even if, you know, everybody's got their elbows up and, you know, like it's like, just put your elbows down, you people. Yeah. Elbows down. Okay, we'll start this one. But, uh, uh, but at least it was, it was, always seemed like it was fun and then you get these sort of drunken skinhead you know people who are actually actually angry 
you know, and yeah. just would go to shows just to start fights and stuff like that. It's like, well, no, that's that's not really what what it's 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 for. It's yeah. fun to you know listen to fast music and you know have a wild time, but you know people are just you know just looking for a reason to start trouble. It's like well, that's just stupid, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And, then it stopped it stopped punk rock from being fun I, you know kind of by 86 87 i mean uh, a lot of people weren't going to shows at all it's just went like i'm done with this right so and then you know then it it changed and then and like uh, going back to an earlier point you made that uh, when people sort of tried to make a, a more hard rock scene um you know from their previous punk bands which which is to me is fine for people to play different music but it usually makes more sense if you change the name of the band instead of trying to use your past success. It'd be like, a, you know, if DOA had become like, a, like, a, uh, dude, like that, that kind of band. Rock, and, man. Oh yeah. You old DOA fans are got like, who the fuck are these guys? Right. Like, you know, oh, these guys used to be good. They suck now. You know I mean? See, it's really a difficult thing because people want to progress in music or they want to get successful or, or they just want to have fun. Like you said earlier on, that that's some of the great magic, the early punk rock, that it was just, you could have three or four just crazy, bizarre people that just happened to meet, and all of a sudden they made a great fucking band, right? And those elements you can't replace, even if you got somebody who's maybe a better player or like uh, more pro or whatever, that kind of right, thing. Right, that's, right, 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 for yeah, sure. It just, the, the magic of that kind of just weird approach, uh, all of a sudden, it was the band lost it, right? Or at least part of it sometimes, right? So, yeah. You know. um, but, you know, I think I, th- so I, yeah, I do sort of think that 1982, at least in Seattle, things were, you know, turning and, and that's why that bit, the band, The Living, I believe, probably started in about 19, in later 1981. And, right. you know, how far into 1982, I was still trying to find the date that this, this recording was made, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just because even from month to month, just looking on the Fastbacks gig calendar and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, it's like, wow, you know, so much changed from month to month. You know, yeah. it was just every everything was was just flying around and and uh, you know, just just young people on fire, I guess, you know, just getting bored and yeah, yeah. do more. And it's like, oh, this is stupid. I'm getting out of this and 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 stuff. And, um, so it's it's just fascinating, you know. I still don't know exactly what day it was. Have you heard? Have you heard this uh, recording? The living. I listened uh, to parts of it. I was listening to the. Uh, uh, I guess it's the single today. Um, oh yeah, yeah. There's the video one I watched. Uh, I watched yeah. on YouTube. It was cool. Um, it was pretty funny. I don't know where they dug up all that old footage, but uh, with the crowd, like the the band was pretty a little bit hard to see for sure, but. The crowd stuff up close was like pretty rich, uh, you know, because like I just think like the way, you know the way punks look now and the way the punks look then, it was just a pretty interesting uh, cross section because you had a lot of people that would show up at shows and uh, they just their brother had told them, oh these guys are cool and show up right and then, then all of a sudden it's their first exposure it's just I'm like wow like crazy band right so yeah i mean the record sounds good i mean what's like eight nine songs or so i think it's just seven it's about it's 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 seven, you know, okay yeah yeah 15 yeah. minutes <laughs> yeah, that, that, hey that's all you need right i mean uh i know it's good um didn't the parts do like uh the first cp was like 19 songs on a seven inch they're like that's about 14 minutes long or something right you know yeah yeah I think better 14 That's or 15 like, minutes of good music than, uh, yeah. you know, 38 minutes of, of, of non-good. <laughs> well, I just, it was my favorite title and cover all the time because this world fucking stinks. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> every, every time I look at that, I laugh. Right. It's just like, you know, but, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. And we did, uh, there was, gosh, that was at the gorilla room. Uh, DOA farts fastbacks, whatever that that had to have been 1981 for sure. Right, and because there's two two places, there's a gorilla room that we play with you there, and but later on we played again with at Gorilla Gardens, which is totally right. different. 
Yeah, yeah, which which was, you know, maybe the same person presiding over it, but yeah, they were very different. Uh, the Gorilla Room was just a little tiny bar downtown. I, I, I 81, okay, that show, um, the last song of their encore, I fell off the stage and I end up with like a walking cast and that was the start of the Hard Grey One Tour, was it started at, at the Gorilla Room in Seattle. Uh, so that was probably like April 1981. So I ended up with a walking cast for about the next six, six shows. I had to sit down on a stool. So it would, so we just put Randy in the middle to entertain people. And then <laughs> it, it, it worked, right? <laughs> well, I guess, I guess, you know, show must go on. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you know, Kurt, uh, I've been around long enough show business. I, I did my training with P.T. Barnum, and later on, I, I worked with Jack Benny and Vaudeville, right? That, that's how I know all this shit, right? <laughs> yeah, I learned, so with, I learned with some of the best. <laughs> I Mr. Barnum. The skills and worked my way down, right? Yeah, yeah. Jack Benny, he had, the best, uh, he had the best book of rules in the business. <laughs> I'm also thinking of, um, oh, well, how did, how did you... How did you hear of the living? Like, I know that uh, there was that. I don't think I really did till we, till, I don't think we really did till we arrived at the show, right? Yeah, 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 now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we knew Duff, of course, right? So I, I, I obviously, uh, but uh, just so, okay, uh, here's a new band type thing, right? So I yeah, was yeah, just yeah. like, okay, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, it's like, it was, it was just one of those things. You, you, we kind of, I, to, Back then and to this day, I was always been kind of like people go like, "Who are we playing with tonight?" I'm like, "I don't know. We'll find out when we get there, right?" So it kind of goes with our old mantra. A lot of times we didn't know the directions or the address of the club, and their our old manager would go like, "Me and Randy be driving, and we go like, okay, um, so what's the address?" He says, "I don't know. I just drive into town and look for punks." Right. <laughs> and that was our modus operandi. So we did get the one was done, fellas. And we did, we knew the address, but uh, we looked for punks and they were there. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> just look for all of the, where all of the, 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 where all the punk kids are hanging out. That must be our show there. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of because it was kind of like an odd location, too, wasn't it? It was like, oh, yeah. Right yeah there was, it, it was, you know, it was sort of near Queen Anne Hill, which would not be the uh, not be the first choice of a location for a for a punk show. But then, but it was up a up a driveway, and you know, like a you had to drive yeah. up a, sort of a, a gravel road a little bit. It was sort of in the middle of nowhere, you know, in the middle yeah, of the city for sure. But it was a, a place that you couldn't see from the street. So I could imagine imagine anybody you know anybody would have a hard time finding it, and I think you know there were a few punk shows that were put on there over the years, but it was right. never a it was never a hangout. It was never a a, a known. Yeah. A yeah known. So it was just an odd location. I just remember it being all in all like a good show, except for the fact that I was like. 110 degrees. Yeah, except, except it was a you know a sweat fest. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, I was also thinking of the, uh, you know, back then, you know, we were all turning 21, but uh, the fastbacks, we were, but right, not, right. Not, not, not everybody else. We used to come up to Vancouver all the time to see not only the hall shows, which, you yeah. know, oftentimes we'd be on the bill or our friends would be, um, but also to go. And it's something that we didn't have, something that didn't work the same way in Seattle. Um, you know, we would have hall shows, yeah. you know, but we didn't have a place like the Smile and Buddha, you know, that had, you know, proper, you know, rock shows and, a, and an okay sound system. And, yeah. and the fact that we could get in, you could get in before you were before you're 21. And I, of course, you had right. to be 18. And there was a few times that some of our friends who were only 17 would come up with us to go to the Smiling Buddha to see some shows and had to wait out in the car. It's like, I mean, uh, what was the guy's name? Igor, the door there, right? Igor, the doorman, who was like 6'5 yeah. and 300 pounds, and he filled the entire door. Yeah. Like, yeah, and uh, yeah, anyway. no, yeah, and, uh, Igor was a, a mainstay. Yeah, no ID, no entry. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. Uh, a Croatian guy, right? And, yeah, yeah. And, and Igor is great. 
Hey, I guess, well, you guys kind of missed out because uh, me and Rampage had this scam at the Buddha because when we would play there, um, it would always uh, always be sold out, which wasn't much, like a 105 people was the occupant, occupancy. And then last one, the owner would look at me and go, Joey, too many people, too many people. I went, no, okay, okay. So then I'd say, Randy, you go around the back and um, anybody that, who can't get in, tell them to go around the back collect two bucks each off of them and then i'll be i then there was a way you could look from the back door down to the bar and i would wait till like uh randy and gather some people i looked down and see if the bar people were looking and i opened the door and randy would grab all the money off these guys and at 10 20 more people come in and then we'd wait like another 20 minutes and then randy would go around the back collect the money and i'd open the door and finally you'd have like a hundred person club there'd be like 250 people in it and and it's not like you could go out you know even if it was in the middle of the summer you couldn't go out on the sidewalk and come back in remember because it was always i the thing i remember more than anything was no in the rights <laughs> you, know, you couldn't it didn't matter if it was in the middle of uh if it was in the middle of in the middle of the summer, you know, there was nobody, uh, nobody, nobody getting in and out of there for sure. Yeah, and it stank. Well, I mean, hey, that's okay. The beer is a dollar fifty. It was two bucks to get in, or two fifty, right? Right, so, right. It, it, you know, it was just fantastic. And you know, yeah. I mean, we from the time we were eighteen to the time that we were twenty-one, at least. I mean, we'd come up to see shows in in Vancouver all the time, and. Yeah. Of course, you could buy beers, but we didn't even drink back then, really. And then every time we did, you'd start drinking the high test or, you know, one of those beers. And, you know, just it was like, we don't have any beer like this out here or down here. And and it was just, you know, like just, the you know, the totally the weird, the weirdest, uh, the weirdest scene as far as that goes. But um, yeah, somehow, somehow it worked. Yeah, you're right. Because we combined the old ages. Uh... The hall shows were great. The hall shows didn't last very long because we usually use them once or twice. Then something would get wrecked, and then the the hall people would like go like, "You're not coming back here." Um, I remember one that Arcadian hall. You guys play with us, and uh, um, people started throwing water all over the bands, like buckets of water over the floor. So it's like water on the stage, on the floor, and the guy I rented was this little uh, little Welsh guy. And uh, he was looking for me afterwards because I'd always go rent rent the halls and he'd go like, uh, afterwards he's looking for me. So I saw him and I put like an amp on my shoulder so he couldn't see my face. So I was trying to get away. And he go, where's that Jill Keithley? Me grandmother can play better music than that. <laughs> <laughs> so I did the, the halls because I, I, I'd go rent them and uh, they'd say, oh, what do we use for? Well, I put it on the dance for young people. They go, oh, would you like some chairs? No, I don't think the chairs would be a good idea because you know, <laughs> the chairs also be flying objects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The less, the less you had in the uh, in the area, the better. You know, like we and we do the hall shows down here, and we'd take all the chairs and you know we think we were doing a good job putting everything back like in the kitchen and then closing the door and yeah, yeah. putting something in front of the thing and. And, and everything and sometimes that worked and you know like I mean you just think of it it just seems like like kids are a little better behaved these days than they were back then I mean it just <laughs> seemed like you know people just go back in the kitchen and just smash a bunch of stuff you know for no reason and it's yep. like well you know I understand that that you know the that urge to do stupid things but it, you know people don't seem like they do dumb shit like that anymore and that's that's fine yeah i know it's okay <laughs> you know and yeah, it, I, same yeah. here like the the hall shows you know run out whenever they did in 82 or whatever people you just run out of places to do them and people wouldn't yeah. you know oh uh, we know you you're in a band so you'd have somebody else go talk to the guy because they were mostly <laughs> little old guys you know just renting their hall and that's you yep. know that they had their meetings in and you know if you trashed it then they wouldn't have a uh, a place for their thing you know whatever whenever yep. it was the next next yeah, self-preservation self-preservation on the hall's part <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but uh you know just yeah. think of going up like you know constantly something at the at the buddha you know something at the commodore 
Yeah, it was just great it, place. It was it was really a great scene up there at the time when the Seattle scene. I mean, like by 1983 or 80, whatever it was, we had the Metropolis, which had shows yeah. every weekend. But before that, you know, there just wasn't there. There was the Gorilla Room, the Gorilla Gardens didn't really start until a little bit later 84 maybe yeah right um so that 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 crucial that crucial time there again 1982 where you know everybody wanted something to happen and everybody was kicking at all the the doors and trying to trying to make something happen and regrouping and trying to find combinations of people that were gung-ho and and trying to make things happen and um you know, it was just it was it was an uphill uh, uphill battle for us in Seattle at that time. That's well, I say, well, that gives evidence to like a, like um, a tough, uh, and the, the guys in the living just like um, you know got to try something different. And he's playing all sorts of different instruments. So it's just like anything to try and um, you know I'm gonna you know I'm gonna do something uh, creative. And so it's like this is like uh, a, a way to a way to get at it. So you know, it, and you know what. Uh, like uh, as I said before, this is a time when, like, you know, maybe a year after that, the whole scene, the original scene was kind of like, yeah, it wasn't completely done. But a lot of the old friends that were still hanging around previously, they weren't coming out anymore. You know, people had gone on and started doing different things, right? You now, I mean, I guess people would also like you talk about changes that uh, people got tired of, like, of, uh, uh, even if you were traveling, they got tired of like sleeping on the floor. With they using uh, like a, a cat box as your, as your pillow, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Like, um, you know, I guess it was probably, you know, well into the eighties. You know, that you just it's just like, are you just banging your head against the wall if something's not yeah. happening? And you do get tired of sleeping in the cat box, and it's like, well, and then yeah. then you see some, you know, oh, well, this band has a label deal and they're sleeping in, uh, you know, hotel rooms or Motel Six or something like that. <laughs> At least you know? not, yeah. And and you know, it was like that. Well, that would that would be that would be deluxe, you know. And it's like, well, you know, sometimes if if you had a day off and you didn't have a show, you'd sport for a you know, a uh, Motel 6 room and everybody would cram into it and, you know, but, uh, you know, it, it was, it was tough. That was, it was pretty much a, pretty much a thankless job <laughs> other than actually yeah. getting to play the shows and, and having fun and, and, yeah, and, that, and all that. that. Yeah, that's the best part. You just hope your van didn't break down. You know, we made your way from town to town, you know, driving in some crummy old van, not getting paid and, uh, but having a great time doing it, right? I mean, that's a big, big, big reason why I kept playing all these years, right? It's just like, um, it's great to get up on stage and, uh, you know, get drive people crazy, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. It, it's the, you know, the payoff is, is, yeah. is, uh, is, 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 is full. The payoff is, is, is where it's, uh, is, is the thing. Yeah. That's about the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you're in a band with people that you like too. Oh, okay. oh, you know? oh, that. Oh, yeah. And I, uh, <laughs> uh, right. Uh, huh. <laughs> when I know that, I know that's a you know that's a tough thing because anybody, even if you start out liking them, you know, being in a van, you know, for any amount of time is gonna gonna take its toll. But if you didn't like them to begin with, like people are always asking, you know, people ask me like what is your what do you recommend you know to people that are trying to start a band now you know yeah. to try to try to make things you know work okay and it's you know play with people that you like and uh -huh. actually play music that you're really into into like you know of course back then if somebody called you up and said oh do you want to play in this band you know that's going somewhere that's actually doing something and you have a chance right. to make a record that has a budget and you have a chance to you know stay in a motel six and you know not be you know stinky constantly you know of course that would be a a pretty a pretty big thing and you know like well maybe oh maybe it's worth playing music that i don't care about that much or i don't really like these people you know but you know, if you're 21 or 18 or 19 or whatever, you know, you're more likely to do something like that. And, and fortunately, I've never had to, I never had to do that. Like everything that I did was with people that I liked and for the yeah. most part music that I liked. Um, 
in but if you're playing music you like with with people that you can at least tolerate then it's hard to look back at it and think you know what was i doing you know you may have not got anywhere but hopefully you will have made something that you're proud of you know and and, yeah i would say yeah no i I think that's a really good rule uh that uh i mean doa was always founded on friendship um you know and you know people changed as we went right so i mean like uh Randy left, Chuck left after a while, Neil after four years, the kind of core group broke up. Um, you know, and we were still friends, but it was, you know, the things had changed. We'd done an awful lot together over that time and uh, uh, and how fast we were going somewhere, you know, then people go, oh, and then we're not going, you know, we're going somewhere, but we're not getting there fast. You know what I mean? I think I can get there faster doing something else. I mean, so that happens, like people, people Believe, but that's really good advice play with friends and play what you want you know because like if you play what you want and you to me and you keep working at it and getting better and better and better this is usually what i tell young bands is that sooner or later somebody's gonna go wow these guys are fucking great you know and you know it's like even though the style might have got like retread around us you know three or four times over the years so what if it's what you enjoy doing you know and I always say I, when I see bands, it's kind of go, they follow like uh, musical trends and keep going in flux. That's when they kind of lose their core. And we talked about that earlier that uh, <clears throat> if you want to play music that's uh, 180 degrees different than what you started out with, then fine. But just give yourself the band a different name, right? Well, right, right. It's, it's, it's so, call it yeah, something different and, and go head on. And that, yeah. that doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean you have to stop your other thing too. You can just put yeah. it on hold, give something a try. And, you know, I guess that's also what sort of ruined, what burned out so many bands in the 70s is, you know, they just, people didn't didn't have the opportunity to take a break, you know, and right. even, into the, even into the 80s and the 90s and, and you know, and, and, and whatnot, you know, like, uh, you know, they, they were manager driven and they were, you know, it's like you got to keep going, and and you know these poor. You think of you know Humble Pie or some band in the seventies. It's like, did they ever get a you know? Did they ever get a week off? Did uh, you know? Was there ever, ever any time to just sit around? It's like, nope, your tour is done. Start working on your new record. Okay, we got to send you. You know, they and and gosh, you know, you just yeah. they, they, you you couldn't you couldn't stay together. You know. It's gonna yeah. blow up, you know. I think we well in the 1985 was our busiest year. We went to Europe, did a double circle around North America, and came back and toured Canada again after Europe. And I think we did. We were on the road for like 300 days, saw 365. And I was just like, and a bunch of equipment blew up, vans blew up, and we came back after that. That amount of time traveling, that many shows, and we came back flat broke. And we're just kind of like, and we've been going by seven years by this point. We're just going like, hmm, I, what part of this is not working properly? <laughs> like, you know, the part it sucks, right? Yeah. Of a year of, you know, absolutely busting your butt. <laughs> yeah, just like uh, hellacious, like playing on, uh, either playing or traveling every single day, right? So if we weren't playing that day, it's because the drive was too long. Right. So, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. That's just like couldn't physically get to the next town or whatever. Right. Yeah. 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 Just thinking of some of the drives that people did back then. Oh, yeah. Don't worry. We can play, drive 10 hours, 12 yeah. hours, and drive right up to the club and unload and start playing. It's like, oh, cool. Yeah. I, we did that lots of times. It's just like unbelievable where we'd arrive 10 minutes, people were supposed to be on. Right, we would drive for like 16 hours. You're like, oh. uh, you know, it's kind of like one your one speeding ticket or one flat tire away from missing the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from, from missing. The, yeah. Wow. Good. And uh, you know, what? What can you say? <laughs> you spent a you spent 1985. <laughs> 306, broke, yeah. 360 days, you said? <laughs> yeah, and both the two vans blew up, so we lost a ton of money on both of them. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Left. 
Yeah, I just left them. That the vans actually kind of bankrupt the tour. We were doing okay until that happened. And then we're like, oh, okay, well that didn't work out very well. <laughs> yeah, you can always find a Marshall in a four twelve cabinet pretty easy, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. you know, to buy a van that'll drive, uh, you know, drive you around the world. Yeah, no, no, it's like. Yeah, it's tough, it's tough to find the amenable one, right? So I mean, at one point there occurred, I was going to write a book. Uh, it was called uh, uh, My Friends, The Garage Mechanics of America, because I think I know every one of them, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, you know, I was also, uh, you know, just, I guess we kind of talked about the, the difference between the Vancouver music scene and the Seattle music scene of, of that time. Yep. And, you know, as far as we knew, the, uh, you know, the Vancouver scene, you know, you guys did, you know, you had the, the DOA and the subhumans. And I think the point at six probably stopped in about 1980 or 81. 81, they had an, uh, yeah, probably about 81. And they probably played a little bit into 82, maybe early 83, but very sporadically like the the, the the steam had totally gone off of it at that point yeah which which seems weird now too because that that their album is is absolutely killer you know you'd think that oh we did this yeah. you know i mean i guess they went to england and did, did the album that didn't actually come out and you know then yeah, came back and, and made a, a, a pop rock classic record and then pretty much split up yeah it, but if the one thing like i say for people that don't know the point of six were kind of pop punk band that they and they got signed to stiff records who put out the dams and all sorts of people mm -hmm. uh in the uk like very successful and they got this nigel something rather who had produced the police's first album and so they got signed to this label so they were going to be like the next big thing as far as like us people in vancouver where the west coast of canada went and they got over there, did the record, and the, the label hated it and, did, and uh, did, shelved it. And so they came back and did the, the same set of songs with uh, Bob Rock uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in Vancouver. Right. So, uh, but the, the momentum that they had from the beginning of 1980 and then not getting the album up by the end of 1980 just kind of took the steam of it. And they were still a good, really good band and they still had great songs. But it was just a really all of a sudden, like, Ugh, they hadn't fallen off a cliff, but it was just like, you know, their drive that they'd had a couple years earlier was, I don't know what happened, but just like, it right, right. Fizzled. And, yeah. you know, probably yeah. the same as every band, you know, they yeah. really thought they were getting somewhere and they were really had great songs and absolutely great band. Um, and, you know, oh, we're going to go to England and make our, you know, debut record and it's going to be great. And and then yep. everything just sort of, and, you know, it's like, oh, what are we doing? Banging our heads against the wall. We did all this stuff. We still haven't generated a dime. And, you know, everybody likes our band, but, you know. Yep. But fortunately. Yeah, you can only get, get so far uh, on people going, well, you guys are great, but then you know, if you're not, you know, then you get to the point where people are getting a little bit older and think, oh, I've been playing for a while, we should be making a living, which is some of the points we've been making here. I mean, when the point six broke up, Chuck had quit. So Dimwit, who I'd grown up in high school with, had our high school bands, all of a sudden he became the DOA drummer. And then uh, we got Wimpy from the Subhumans. Mm -hmm. So we knew when, Wim when Wimpy to play bass, when uh, Randy was out, and you know, we knew for sure that was the death knell for the Subhumans. That, it, Wimpy has st st stuck in there with them, but he was just go. So it was like, for us, it was like, uh, it was old, like our old high school band, except that <laughs> was a, a different form. We did. Yeah, we were terrible when we were 15 or 16, but now all of like we were 22 and we had our high school band back together again, but it was called DOA, right? So, you know, for the second lineup right now. So, yeah, yeah. It was a weird, weird, weird thing, right? So. And you know what a great lineup that was. Was that was that was that that was going probably in eighty five. That was probably your yeah. That would be eighty two to eighty five. Dimwit on drums, Wimpy on bass, Dave yeah. on guitar, and me on guitar. Right. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So you know, Chuck and Randy left, and we picked up Wimpy and Dimwit. It's kind of like a hockey team. You know, we 
they they got released or they got traded. You know, we traded Chuck the Black Flag for a thousand bucks, and uh, Randy got cut on waivers and then got picked up by an Annihilator. Um, and we you know we drafted Wimpy and Dimwit from other bands, and you know continued on our quest to try and win the Stanley Cup. Right, so it's a, a Canadian's dream. <laughs> and, and and everybody knew all the songs anyway, so it's just like, it's just like yeah, yeah, it's like uh, yeah. I mean, some of them we'd written, uh, we're playing stuff we'd written where we, we have back called the Skulls in '77, our first punk rock band, and uh, we're doing you know that's a bunch. That was some of the early mainstay TOA songs were back from then, you know. So so be it. If they're good songs, we're playing them a few years later, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know that was. I mean, I, I remember loving the the original three piece. Well, I guess when we first saw you guys in '78, um, it was the first first of your shows as a three piece. Is that right? Um, I think well, I read somewhere that Brad Kent stayed yeah. in San Francisco. He didn't make the make the trek up to Seattle or something. Yeah, we. Uh... Our first trip, our, our first road trip to the Mubuhe in San Francisco. We had two shows there. And um, I took a train. Chuck and Randy took a bus. And Brad hitchhiked uh, down the, he had his lust ball in one hand, without a case, and hitchhiked down the I 5 from Van Vancouver to uh, San Francisco. And got there late, just barely made the shows. And then he didn't get to the Seattle one. So, but we have been playing as a three piece before that. Um, but then all of a sudden, uh brad wasn't there so i went oh crap i got to play guitar again i kind of stopped playing for a little bit right and uh i remember being a little bit rusty at that show and then uh after that show uh me and chuck said that brad was out and uh brad went and uh, joined the avengers he liked hanging out in san francisco and got into a great band right you know so he was in the avengers for maybe about the last eight months of their Existence. Yeah, I mean, I know they're reformed now, but um, yeah, yeah, the yeah, original yeah. tenure. Yeah, yeah. Back in, back in the, the the original the original days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys were great. That was a great band. Oh, for sure. I mean, we you know the Avengers would yeah, hang yeah. up here definitely a few times yeah. in in Excellent. 1978. And yeah, know. yeah, they were touring around. They were kind of like the they were kind of like the first band to come up here, right? And uh, you know, um, and the first band the we opened for them in San Francisco and people were going wild. The place was, place was packed. And uh, that was kind of like the band from the originals. I think they opened for the Sex Pistols. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think, I think yeah. they did yeah, the Sex Pistols. Yeah, win, yeah, in, in, Winterland or whatever, yeah. you know, for that one one tour the Pistols had. And uh, yeah, they were the shit. Uh, like there was the, kind of the West Coast band. I mean, and really also like kind of, they're kind of before the LA scene really took off, even though it was like, all sorts of elements of the LA scene. The Avengers kind of got, you know, fairly big prominence before that, right? You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So, yep, good records, good band, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we, it's just, it's just hard to imagine, you know, people now that, of course, there's internets and all kinds of other things, like how much, how much actual work it was to get a band to that point, you yeah. know, because there weren't, places to play all over the place i mean you had to you know you were all almost like you know not to not to make it sound like you're you know an army of punk rockers or anything like that but the places you end up playing were not necessarily places that normally had music like that because yep. you know in 1978 there wasn't much music like that and most of it was absolutely underground so if you you know, wanted to go to different cities, you know, you, you talk on the phone and maybe, you know, as you said, Chuck Dukowski, oh, oh don't play there. You know, that, <laughs> that's a bad idea. But, yeah. um, you know, it was, it was, you were really going out on a limb. You're going into, it was like space travel or something. You know, you had no idea what you're, what you're that getting. Was like, really. That it's was like, like uh, well, it was like uh, people crossing uh, the United States in covered wagons, just the, the frontier. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Same akin to that, right? <laughs> and, and certainly there were people that were absolutely hostile, you know, the, the holdouts for regular rock. It's like, no, oh, we don't yeah. like punk rock. That's, you know, that's baloney, you know. And, and Yeah, no, we got lots of fights with people that hated us, just like, you know, 
they had walked by and they go, why are you trying to play some fucking rock with that thing? You know, I'd be carrying my guitar, right? You know? yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, fuck you. <laughs> You're not just going to play punk, are you? You're going to play some real rock and roll with that. It's like, you got and... play some stones, are you? Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> I love the Rolling Stones, but that was, that was what we were playing. Right, right, right. So, and, and, you know, that with that is sort of the, the funny thing to think about, you know, the early, early days is, is like people didn't just come out of the, you know, come out of the womb playing punk rock. You grew up you know with all kinds of music and and you, you knew the kind of music that you didn't want to play you know was yeah. basically what everybody else was playing in you know at that time you know kind of easy go and bar rock it's like well i just don't want to do that there's well, tons I've, of other stuff that's great but just you know you just want to do something exciting you know either fast yeah. or loud or both you know you know and uh and you just, it's not like everybody hated every other kind of music, you know, so, and it, it you know, it took probably until, uh, I was just thinking of like in around 1982 or so, like, you remember like, you know, people would go to the hall shows and it's like, you know, it's either punk or you suck and, and stuff. And, and you know, if you liked Van Halen or you liked right. uh, ACDC, you know, people are like, oh, that's, that sucks. You suck. You know, and and like right around right around that time, you know, probably there was enough new people listening to music that, you know, it's like, well, it's not all that much different. You know, some music's faster, yeah. slower, but, it, you know, um, it's 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 all fine. And, and thinking that that was probably what happened to some of these bands is like, oh, well, it's you don't have to play only hardcore music or you can you know you can you it's okay to have you know some guitar solos in your songs you don't have to right, you know, right. like, and you know because we, even when we were starting it's like well we're just playing as best we can and trying to make cool songs and you know people throw shit at us and you know it's like why are you throwing stuff at us you know but by about 1982 i always consider that the year that people sort of decided that maybe motorhead was a band that sort of united a bunch of people. It's like, well, they're not, you know, they, they're kind of metal and they're kind of hard rock and they're kind of punk, you know? It's like, yeah. oh, well, so you can like the Ramones and ACDC and Van Halen and Cheap Trick, you know, it's all, it's all fine. There's all, you know, you don't have to hate everything and you don't have to negate everything. And, and you know, so maybe that's- Yeah, I mean, I, no, I agree. I was like, uh, uh, that, it, at first, people were just, you had, had to, I think that's why uh, younger people are different uh, today, because uh, when I grew up, your music was, you like these types of music and everything else, like you said, that all sucked. Everything was in kind of like a silo type thing, and everything outside of that was just, oh, well, you're an idiot, right? You know, Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but I think uh, kids today, they just they can listen to everything, right? So it's, right, and it, it's there's no, a lot, lot it, different it, than that. If you didn't grow yeah. up then, you know, you just, there's, you can listen to all music and people, I, I talk to, you know, younger people are like, oh yeah, uh, I found this band, Sir Lord Baltimore, you know, they're, they're cool. Were they, you know, did you like them when you're, when you're little? It's like, you know, that these bands that weren't, you know, weren't popular, but nobody knows now what was actually popular and what yeah. wasn't. So they just listen to the music that they like. And yeah. it's, 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 it's awesome but also really weird <laughs> well i remember like what got us in the punk rock the bands i remember really specifically uh bands i heard all the time as a high school i hated were like um pablo cruz and uh uh fleetwood mac i didn't like and uh even it didn't like i uh, didn't like fog hat even though some people would like him for like a hard rock perspective but and that was kind of the backdrop that there wasn't like a lot of like crazy, weird, weird rock. Uh, it kind of like died out. Like I remember like you mentioned ACDC. I've been playing in DOA for a couple of years and finally a friend of mine, probably about 1980, says, have you heard of these ACDC guys? They said, no. He says, oh, well, they're kind of like punks from Australia. I went like, really? They put the record on. I went, that's not punk rock, but it's really good. You know what I mean? Like these yeah, guys, yeah, yeah, you know, no, it's it's, 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 it's kick-ass, right? Yeah, 
it's like, you know, maybe like the Rolling Stones played through a MXR distortion plus or something, you know, it's like, <laughs> it, you know, it just, it's, it's, it's rock and roll, but it's, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's yeah, next no, level a... rock and roll, which yeah. is all we were looking for is something, you know, that was a little more exciting. Like you mentioned, Pablo Cruz. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's just like, Terrible. we don't know, we don't know what we want to play or we, you know, but we just know what we don't want to do, you know, yeah, and that, that, was a, that they were a prime example or uh boss gags. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just easy, you know, easy going, you know, light groovy music was just yeah. like the worst. And yeah. and also the bar bands that, you know, dun, 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 you know, that you know, we weren't going to bars then, but you know, you'd go all the bands that you'd hear about were all just kind of regular rock. And it's like, no, you know, we don't want to be yeah. like that. We want to do anything but that. And, yeah, I mean, but that's when when people heard the Ramones, like we saw them, they came to the Vancouver in early 77, I think, and uh, they played the Commodore, holds 1,200 people. They could, they had sold two tickets, so they made it a free show. Uh, I guess it was probably 76, maybe late 76, and um, about 100 people showed up. That was the only people that ever heard of the Ramones. And they, we watched that. They played about a half hour, just played the first album, starting to finish. And at the end, we all looked at each other everyone like oh so that's what punk rock is because we'd see it on tv or read about it and, right know, right but, there was a tv like abc tv news report yeah. on british punk rock and we're like yeah we see the damned looks- or the pistols on tv but we saw the ramones one like that's how you actually play it that's how you perform it and that was like so kick-ass that we couldn't believe yeah, it yeah right yeah yeah for sure i mean you know seeing the ramones you know pretty much changed everything yeah, they were like the best, if you ask me, right? So, like, hey, Kurt, I should probably get going. Okay. Um, yeah, I got to get down to City Hall, believe it oh, or not. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're done with the Zoom meetings now. You're actually going to in-person meetings. <laughs> like, hey, exactly, right? So, yeah. But, uh, no, great talk today. I don't know if there's anything we missed out, right? But Oh, well, you know, let's see. Let me see if there's something that they'd sent. Uh, um. I think that all the other things are things that I can just say myself, the intros and the outros. Um, okay. And, and that I'm just, you know, but uh, you know, I think, I think, I think we got some good, I think we got some good shit here. Okay, good, good. And great seeing you. And uh, yeah, no, glad, glad to help out. This is still lots of fun. To, anytime you get to talk about um, uh, the real, good old days and they were like a ton of fun right it's a, yeah yeah it's, absolutely yeah, it's, it's, it's a blast and right? we're so, very lucky yeah. to still be talking about them and uh yep yeah, yeah that, and, and knock on wood and uh here's all our friends they're not around anymore i miss them all right so but uh, this you know we're still here so yep so crank up your car your- at your next yep. available opportunity and have a good uh have a good rest of your day okay thanks sir okay take care thanks joe all right Talk to all you right. Later. Yeah, we hope you enjoyed this episode of the Living 1982 podcast. Circle back for weekly episodes and find out about each week's special guests and where to stream the music by following the band's release on Instagram at the Living 1982.